It's NBA draft eve and all through the house, everything is quiet while I put together mock draft 5.0, my final mock draft before the 2021 NBA draft. I'm going to share it with you today on our podcast. You're listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Locked On Podcast Network. Aloha. The Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Aloha, you're listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Locked On Podcast Network. It is NBA Draft Eve, and I've been working all night putting together the finishing touches on Mock Draft 5.0, my last mock draft of the 2021 NBA Draft. Now, I say final mock draft, but I should have a caveat here for those listening at home that on Thursday, I'm going to continue to talk to the NBA team. We're going to look at trades, other things that might go down during the day. And we'll be updating that mock draft live throughout the day until about one hour before the draft. So if you're one of my subscribers over on NBABigBoard.com, you'll get an email with an update on that uh, on that mock draft whenever it comes out throughout the day, whenever there's breaking news or anything else. So make sure that you go over to NBABigBoard.com and subscribe so you get the latest mock draft from me. But I want to talk about where we're at right now on Wednesday night with the NBA draft coming Thursday. What I'm seeing right now, I'm going to stop updating that mock draft about an hour before the draft. Why? Because I'm going to go live on Locked On NBA podcast, and you can go over and subscribe to their YouTube channel, Locked On NBA. I'm going to be with Rafael Barlow, John Corrales. We are going to do the entire draft about an hour before the draft starts at 7 p.m. Eastern. We're going to go through the draft round one, round two, Lots of analysis are going to bring in all of our Locked On podcast hosts for their local reaction as different teams make different selections. Then we'll do some post-game analysis. And then even after that, going to do draft grades with Rafael Barlow for both the Eastern and Western Conference. There's so much going on. But before we jump there, and I hope you're going to follow us live on draft night, let's talk about this draft. Let's talk about my mock draft. It wasn't easy to put together. Uh, you know, this is one of those things where the phone calls are keep coming in. I just, my phone just buzzed just a second ago right now with people. And so, but I, I wanted to take a time out and say, okay, it, it, everything's a little bit quiet tonight. Here's what we're sort of hearing uh, from teams. Again, things can change on Thursday. Absolutely. But I want to give you an idea of where we're at right now with the mock draft. And it starts with the Detroit Pistons at one. We still have Cade Cunningham there. He was number one on our big board all year. He's been number one in every mock draft that we've done. I know there's some folks on the internet saying Chad doesn't like Cade Cunningham or he's not number one. No, he's number one on our big board. He's number one on our mock draft. He was even number one on my personal mock draft. I do think he is the number one pick in this draft. And I do expect the Detroit Pistons to select him at number one. Now, a couple of caveats there. They do like Jalen Green. He had a great workout there. Um, There is some internal discussions within their front office about Jalen Green at number one. Two, they have talked to teams about trading down one, two spots in the draft. I really haven't heard anything of them of, of trading out even further than that right now. And so there's the possibility that Detroit could trade. However, I think both of those things, drafting Jalen Green or uh, trading out of the number one pick are highly unlikely. I think that we're feeling right now like the most likely scenario is that um, we are going to be seeing the Detroit Pistons drafting Cade Cunningham at number one. I think uh, I think Pistons fans are going to be pretty stoked uh, to hear that. At number two, I think the draft is probably going to go according to form. We're hearing Jalen Green uh, going to the Houston Rockets. I think it is going to probably likely be Jalen Green going a number two to the Rockets. There have been some internal discussions about Evan Mobley there too, but it seems like that is where the Rockets are heavily leaning um, at this point, and they are going to draft the most dynamic score in this draft, the guy that can really drop, I think, 25 points a night in the NBA someday. He's probably going to have some 40-point games even as a rookie. He's just that dynamic of a scorer. He's an incredible athlete. I'm really stoked about Jalen Green's future. He's a Tier 1 prospect for me, which means that I believe that he can be a superstar. So I'm really excited about Green's future, and I think he's a really good fit 
um, in Houston uh, as well. I always felt like Jalen Green's best fit was in Detroit, but I understand why the Pistons would select Cade Cunningham, number one. I think it's the safest choice. I think it's the least controversial, and I think Cade's going to be awesome right away in year one. I also think Jalen Green's going to be pretty awesome in year one, too, at least on offense. I do think there's questions about his defense. I do think there's questions about his passing ability, getting other people involved in the game. All of that is legitimate if you want to take a few swipes at Jalen Green. But to me, he is going to be electric, and I think he's going to be the guy that you're going to see over and over again as someone who is really on Sports Center, night in, night out, got that it, fa- it factor, going to be the guy that's going to be marketed. I, I can understand why the Rockets are high on him at two. At three, that leaves the Cleveland Cavaliers. I think it will be Evan Mobley out of USC, the seven foot big man unicorn that can do just about everything. He can handle the ball, he can shoot the basketball, he can block shots, he can rebound, uh, he can score in the post. He's skinny. But he is an excellent athlete. He's really fluid. He's really a guy to me that I think is just so fascinating in what he can do and and what ultimately he could be in the NBA. I know I've gotten knocked by some people quoting a scout that said he's sort of Chris Bosh on offense and then Anthony Davis on defense. And I, I get it. I get that if you put those two together, you've got like one of the greatest players of all time. And I don't think that's exactly what the scout meant. I just think it meant that when, when we think about Chris Bosh, you think about an offensive player who was solid defensively, but not great where Mobley's defensive abilities remind him a little bit of Anthony Davis. I'm not saying that the combination of those two is going to make him a greater player than Anthony Davis, for example, who I think is one of the best players in the NBA. I will say this about Evan Mobley. If he gets it, If all of those skills continue to get refined, if he continues to improve as a shooter, if he's able to continue to improve as a ball handler and a passer, and he continues to get stronger um, so that he can guard players in the post, he's got a shot at being a top five player in the NBA. And I think he has the highest ceiling of any of the prospects in this draft. So him falling to three to Cleveland is a big, big deal. I know some Cavs fans worry that maybe he's not a great fit with Jared Allen. And, you know, all I have to say to that are a couple of things. One, I don't think you care if you're Cleveland right now. I actually don't think the fit is bad. I also think there's a, a chance that Jared Allen's going to get a huge free agent offer that maybe the, the, the Cavs aren't going to want to offer uh, or match that offer. And so this gives them the freedom to not be able to do that. I will say the Cavs have been involved in some trade rumors uh, out there. Uh, teams trying to move up, including Oklahoma City uh, into the top three. Actually, Toronto also trying to move up into the top three. There's some chances, I think, that that Cleveland is the team that maybe does move out. I at least had several general managers tell me that they think that the most likely scenario for Oklahoma City to move up in this draft is to get to three to Cleveland. However, I'm also hearing tonight Cleveland's been resisting those advances so long. They actually like Evan Mobley and think that that's a good pick there. And so for now, I think the most likely scenario is at number three, you are going to see Evan Mobley um, drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers. At four, we've got the Toronto Raptors. And to me, this is where things get a little bit interesting because I am not sure exactly what's going to go down in Toronto. And this was the first place in my mock that I really felt stuck because I'm hearing out of them that they really like Scotty Barnes, that Scotty Barnes at 6'8", with a 7'3", wingspan, a guy that can defend five positions on the floor, has this huge upside, which really intrigues them. But also sitting on the board is Jalen Suggs out of Gonzaga, with Kyle Lowry likely leaving this summer uh, as a free agent. Moving Suggs in to play with Fred Van Vliet, it's just an obvious choice. Masai Ujiri, their general manager, loves tough players. Certainly you would say that about Suggs. I also think that you can say that about Scotty Barnes as well. There's an internal debate going on right now in Toronto. The other thing that's happening is Toronto is also just gauging the general trade market right now. Pascal Siakam uh, is out there and they're trying to figure out what they could get for him. Is Do we go into a full rebuilding mode? Do we instead try to build this team back up and be a playoff contender? I think they're trying to figure all of that out right now. They're doing that by gauging the trade market. Certainly Golden State is a team that one would be interested in moving up for Jalen Suggs. And so if you really want to blow it up, you probably could get Wiseman and maybe number seven to for the Warriors to move up to get 
uh, Jalen Suggs. That's one option uh, for Toronto. The other option is that they're doing a bigger deal with with you know with Pascal Siakam in it. They're getting more assets from the Warriors down the road. Andrew Wiggins comes back in that deal, and it's it's a bigger bigger trade. Uh, and in that particular case, the Raptors are keeping the fourth pick, so then they would have four, 17, um, 14 as well. I think that that both of those options are good options for uh, Toronto. I think it's likely that Toronto probably make some sort of move here. I think this is the first team that I feel like more confident that maybe they're not there. Uh, at four than some of the other teams that we've been talking about in the past. So I'm really intrigued to what happens there. I do have them taking Jalen Suggs at four if they keep the pick. This was a really hard decision for me. I've been going back and forth myself. I've had Scotty Barnes in the last couple of times going there. I still believe that he's a real possibility there, but there just seems to be too many signals that Suggs may ultimately be the choice there that I'm leaning Suggs right now and that that's who uh, the Toronto Raptors take at number four. And then that leaves the Orlando Magic sitting there at five. And I the Magic have the fifth pick and the eighth pick in the draft. But at five, I think that they're happy with whatever happens there. If Jalen Suggs falls to them, I think they really like him. If it's Scotty Barnes, I think that that's okay as well. They're, the Magic have a long history of liking big, long, athletic, multi-positional players like Barnes. And I certainly think that if Barnes really improves his jump shot he has a chance to be the best player in this in this draft class i sort of think that's like evan mobley and then if you want to talk about just like pure upside it's scotty barnes after that scotty barnes is going to have to do some things to reach it he's going to have to improve significantly as a shooter but if he does you're talking about a guy who can defend all five positions can play all five positions on offense uh, a, a guy that really can help you win in multiple ways and and somebody that i'm personally really really high on right now so huge huge win uh for the magic if they are able to get scotty barnes uh, at five again he may go to the raptors and if that's the case then jalen suggs falls there and i actually think that there's a slight preference in orlando for jalen suggs um, at 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 five. And I almost wonder whether it's behooves the magic to try to figure out how to move up one spot in the draft and make sure that they secure Suggs. I'm getting the feeling out of Orlando right now that they, that the cost would probably be too high to move up one pick in the draft. So they're probably not going to do it. Uh, but it's certainly something that they um, would look at as well. And then I think that we go and we start to look at the Oklahoma City Thunder, who uh, I wrote about on Wednesday and Tony Jones and I talked about in our last podcast. They're trying everything. They're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at how to get up to get Kate Cunningham at one or perhaps Evan Mobley or even Jalen Green at two or three. Right now, uh, they haven't been able to do it. I think one of the questions is whether Shea Gogus alexander is available. Uh, There were reportedly he was offered to the Detroit Pistons along with the six pick in the draft. However, I don't think uh, that Detroit's going to do that deal uh, from all the reports. They turned that down. Would Shea be available at two, at three, uh, maybe even at four in a particular deal? Because maybe if they can't get Evan Mobley or Jalen Green, maybe Scotty Barnes is the guy that they want. I think they're trying. Whether a deal gets done or not, I think is a a significant question that we just really don't have the answer to um, right now. But for now, we're going to keep the Thunder at six. That's where they're sitting right now. And I have them selecting James Booknight um, out of UConn. Again, this was a tough decision. I've had Jonathan Kaminga there uh, for most of the last uh, couple of months, and I still believe Kaminga's in play there. But there's just enough smoke uh, coming out of the draft right now, especially in New York, talking to agents and their players that are in New York right now, that book night is going to be the selection at six. Um, if uh, the Thunder stay at six, that we're moving book night to six now um, on our on our mock draft. And, you know, the interesting thing about book night is that the Thunder have been on him for a while. They really looked at him last year tried to see if they could get him to come into the draft last year. He didn't do that. 
Um, he's obviously a really fantastic scorer. If they're keeping Shea, I think there's a really nice backcourt that starts to come out with Book Knight and Shea Gilgis Alexander. I really like that sort of pairing together um, in the backcourt. And so this is a defensible pick. I have Kaminga higher on my big board um, than James Book Knight. I think personally, I would lean Kaminga, and I, I think that he's a bigger risk. But I think the upside is a little bit higher than Book Knight, who I have as a tier three prospect, while while I have a Jonathan Kaminga as a tier two prospect. And so I think that that again, it's a defensible pick uh, for Oklahoma City if they go Book Knight. I personally would have went. Uh, with Jonathan Kaminga. So look, that's the first six picks in the draft. I I think we knew that those guys were going to go in some order like that. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, really, really good. So now you got to ask yourselves what happens at seven with the Golden State Warriors. We'll tackle that right after we talk about Rock Auto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? They have everything you can need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car and truck. Right, locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. All right. Thank you to Rock Auto for being one of our sponsors. And we've talked about the first six picks in where I have my mock draft sitting right now, mock draft 5.0 over on nbabigboard.com. Detroit gets Cade Cunningham. Houston gets Jalen Green. Cleveland gets Evan Mobley. Toronto gets Jalen Suggs. Orlando gets Scotty, Scotty Barnes. And at six, Oklahoma City selects James Book Knight out of Yukon. And I think that the one surprise probably is Kaminga falling a little bit, but we've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. So I think we know that that's a possibility. What happens at seven to me is the next big turning point uh, in the draft. And this is one, one of the reasons that I think we may end up having to update this mock draft uh, tomorrow over at nbabigboard.com. And just a reminder to go over there, subscribe, get my newsletter. And as we update the mock draft tomorrow from what we're talking about tonight, if there's trades that happen or if we start to get information that one player is going to this place instead of this place or whatever, we'll email you those updates for the mock draft as we roll in uh, to, to tomorrow. But as of tonight, the Warriors are in such an interesting position because They've got a lot of different options right now. They could trade the pick. They've talked about 7 and 14 and James Wiseman to try to go get a superstar, Damian Lillard. Don't think he's necessarily going to be available before tomorrow. Bradley Bill, not sure he's going to be available before tomorrow. Ben Simmons, definitely available, but they don't really have the right package, so they'd have to get a third team involved with Philadelphia, which I think is the big problem there. Pascal Siakam that we talked about, maybe lowering your sights a little bit. You don't get a superstar, but you get an all-star in return. Uh, Maybe that's the deal there. As of Wednesday night, they don't have a deal. And so now you have to start thinking about what you do to select the picks at 7 and 14. And I think the issue for the Warriors right now is do you go young and say, look, we're going to use these draft picks properly. We're going to use them to build for the future. Or do you think about who are the guys that can help you right now? If you're thinking about who the guys are helping you right now, then it's Davian Mitchell at 7, Chris Duarte uh, at 14. If you're thinking about the future, and thinking about who is the guy that could actually help you the most down the road, uh, not in year one or two, but down the road in, in years three, four, and five, then the question maybe moves away from Davian Mitchell a little bit and starts to center on Jonathan Kaminga, who probably has the most upside of anybody left in this draft. Or I'm hearing Franz Wagner's name a lot, the big Michigan wing um, that is one of the best defenders in the draft, still kind of figuring it out from the offensive end, but has some offensive skills there for sure. And then, you know, you start to hear some rumbles about Josh Giddy, uh, the Australian big uh, point forward who is one of the best passing Uh, players in this draft, but struggles shooting the three and struggles with defense. All those guys in the mix uh, for Golden State. 
Uh, I, I personally would advocate for Davian Mitchell here. I think this is one time that I might go after a 22 year old and say it's okay because of what's going on at Golden State and the fact that I just think he's going to be really, really good. I think he's a great player. It sounds like as of tonight, that's what the coaching staff would wish that the Warriors would do. But if they can't get that done, then I'm hearing that it's going to be a tough conversation between Kaminga and Wagner. I've been told even as of last week that if Kaminga fell, oh, no, no, we're taking him. But it sounds like they're starting to grow some consensus now that he's too far away. And if you could get a player like Wagner, he could actually maybe get some minutes because of his defensive abilities. He can stretch the floor a little bit and that he's the better choice as sort of a compromise. He's still young. I mean, he's actually really young for a sophomore. He's really the same age as most of the freshmen. Still has a lot of growth. Uh, available in his game right now, but is a guy that defensively could probably get earn some minutes on the floor for the Warriors. So I have Franz Wagner right now going seven. I do think that Book Knight, if he falls, would would also be a very strong choice there um, for them. And again, Kaminga, I don't think is out of the picture there, as is not Davian Mitchell either. But I think the thinking for Golden State with Davian Mitchell is that there's a high likelihood that he's available at 14. And if he's available at 14, why use the pick at seven when we can have, you know, someone else that, that we have sort of ranked as, as a longer term fit um, at seven. So that's Golden State at seven. Then Orlando sort of sits there at eight. And maybe it's just the case that Jonathan Kaminga is just going to fall in their lap. And if Jonathan Kaminga falls in their lap, it's going to be very hard for the Magic, who always look at long, athletic, raw athletes and project out and say, just like when John Hammond grabbed Giannis Antetokounmpo back in Milwaukee, let's turn this guy into something. Scotty Barnes and Jonathan Kaminga, you know, your shooting's not great. They're definitely different players, but I could see how maybe that's a little bit too much rawness. So it might be interesting as well to see if the Magic, instead of selecting at eight, go ahead and do a deal with maybe Memphis or or perhaps the San Antonio Spurs, uh, who have been looking to get up a little bit further um, in the draft and let them take Kaminga. They slide down a few spots and go after a guy that they've been very high on uh, really this entire draft process, which is Zaire Williams, the Stanford wing, uh, a guy that I actually think would be an acceptable se- selection at eight, though I do have Kaminga higher on my board. Uh, great athlete, can shoot the basketball, can handle a little bit. Um, just your prototypical wing. Had a terrible season, a freshman season at Stanford, and I think that's partly why um, he is somewhat questionable at eight and might be you know, a better pick a little bit further down. Um, for them, I, I don't have a problem with them taking an eight. And, you know, this is John Hammond who took Thon Maker uh, a number of years ago, m- way higher than everybody thought um, that he should go. And, and you know, that one didn't really pan out um, from Milwaukee, but you certainly have a general manager who's not afraid uh, to make a deal. So we're going to be watching uh, the Magic really closely. Moses Moody also sort of in that mix. And certainly if James Book Knight is there, a guy that I think would probably be the top of their list. Um, at Orlando. Chances that are Orlando trading this pick though, I, I think they're they're considerable that they may opt out for something else um, at eight. That leaves the Sacramento Kings at nine. And you know the thing about the Kings that I find so interesting is that they've been big Franz Wagner guys uh, really this entire draft process. This is a very analytics driven front office and Wagner just measures out really well analytically. Uh, But in this particular mock draft that we just talked about, we just had Franz Wagner going seven to the Golden State Warriors. So he's not there. So what does Sacramento do? I guess they could, you know, maybe try to uh, make a deal to move up and give give the Warriors something in return. Or they could take the guy that actually is even a bigger analytics darling uh, than Franz Wagner. That's Alpernin Sengun. Uh, out of Turkey, who uh, Kevin Pelton, who does the analytics work uh, for ESPN, just ranked as the top player in the draft from his analytics models that he's had. I've talked to several other uh, teams and folks that really dive heavily into the analytics. They all love Sengun. They all temper it with, look, we understand that he's a more traditional, back to the basket, low post player, maybe something that you're not Uh, is in vogue in the NBA today where we think about big, switchable, athletic bigs that can stretch the floor. That's not Sengun, uh, but his production in Turkey is so good. It's so high. 
Uh, he's MVP of the Turkish league that I think that there's an argument that he's going to turn into something. Maybe it's not Nikola Jokic, but maybe uh, Vucevic, uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, Doma Sabonis, uh, uh, D- uh, Domata Sabonis, sorry. Uh, maybe that's a- another guy that he could sort of turn into. And at nine, um, that's a pretty good get, especially for Sacramento, who absolutely does need help on their front line, they're aiming for the playoffs. And here's an 18 year old that you're bringing in that actually has played high level basketball um, in Turkey. He's going to be more ready than most of the college prospects that are, that are there. Uh, Trey Murphy is another guy um, that you could hear his name called in Sacramento. So I think it's sort of Wagner, Sengun, uh, and then maybe Trey Murphy uh, at that next level at, at nine at 10. The Memphis Grizzlies, who just recently made a trade uh, with the New Orleans Pelicans, uh, they uh, Grizzlies got Stephen Adams out of that deal. Got Eric Bledsoe, uh, also got the uh, uh, they also got the um, 40th pick in the draft. The Pelicans moved down uh, to 17. Uh, they get Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, they also get the 51st pick in the draft. And you know the question has been all along: What is Memphis doing? Who are they after? Um, why did they move up uh, into the top 10 right now? And I, I think the answer from all the sources that I can hear is that that is Franz Wagner that they're after at 10. The problem, and at least in the mock draft that I'm putting together, is that he's off the board at seven. He isn't available at 10. And now it puts them in the conundrum of, okay, who else do we want on the board? I was told that Memphis is really looking for a three and D wing, someone who's athletic, who can stretch the floor and can defend. And I can see why Franz Wagner uh, would be an interesting choice there. The other names that I'm hearing are more interesting. Moses Moody fits some of that, the three part for sure. The D part probably certainly has length, but he lacks the elite athleticism and elite size for the position. Josh Giddy out of Australia, who doesn't really have three or D uh, to his game, but he is a big playmaker, uh, an excellent ball handler, an excellent passer. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how he fits in Memphis, but hearing quite a bit that he's a guy um, that Memphis could take. And then finally, Zaire Williams out of Stanford, who probably fits the bill more of what they're looking for, but is a little bit raw of a prospect, a little bit riskier. Uh, And maybe they're just not comfortable taking him at 10 the same way. I I certainly, in my opinion, would be. And and I think that Zaire might be a really great fit there. Um, But I am putting Josh Giddy here right now. It seems like there's the most smoke. And that's kind of all it is right now. Most smoke around Giddy um, right now at 10. Again, this is something we'll be digging into on draft day. And as you uh, subscribe to NBABigBoard.com, if we update the mock draft uh, throughout the day, again, maybe there's a trade or we get information. Hey, it's Zaire Williams. It's not um, It's not Josh Giddy. We'll make changes to the mock uh, throughout the day. And if you've subscribed with us in our newsletter, then whenever those changes happen, you'll get an email in your inbox, to let you know what it is. I certainly will be posting those changes on Twitter um, as well as you can see. And then that will cut off about an hour before the draft uh, as we launch into our live draft coverage over on Locked On NBA uh, with, with Rafael Barlow, with uh, John Corrales, with all of our Locked On hosts. And I'm really excited and stoked to be there um, to break down this whole draft. So that, by the way, that whole special is brought to you by Built Bar, one of our great sponsors that has been sponsoring this podcast for a long time. So I want to talk to you for a minute um, about Built Bar because Built Bar is has nine delicious flavors plus the occasional limited flavor. When you talk to a Built Bar fan like myself, they're definitely passionate about their faves. If you don't know the Built Bar flavors, well, you're missing out. There's coconut, there's coconut almond, there's cherry, there's raspberry, there's mint brownie, there's peanut butter brownie, there's double chocolate, there's salted caramel, so there's something for everyone. My personal favorite is the coconut. I actually had one on set today. Uh, Built Bar uh, brought us a bunch of boxes of Built Bars. You'll actually see them on the desk. Um, We were all trying out some of the flavors and everybody was offering me different ones, but I'm like, man, I'm a coconut guy. So I I ate the coconut. It's delicious. It tastes like a candy bar. It's a protein bar. It doesn't taste anything like it. It's actually really delicious. And the best thing about it is they have 17 grams of protein, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, only four grams of net carbs. So order today, get that raspberry or mint brownie or whatever you like. Go to builtbar.com, use promo code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at builtbar.com. I think I'm going to eat a Bill Bar on the air. 
tomorrow night. And again, I want to thank them uh, for uh, their their kindness in really uh, sponsoring this live draft show that we're putting together. I think it's going to be really special. We got the big board. We got gr- a green screen. A green screen. We're in a TV studio. I really think you're going to enjoy it. I understand we're not going to have the prospects coming across, and and that you may want to be watching um, the, the the actual live tele, uh, telecast on ABC or what have you. But I think that if you really want in depth analysis about the draft and these prospects and how they fit with these teams and what's sort of going on in the background, I think you're really going to love the show. And if you haven't tuned into Rafael Barlow yet, I, I think this is one of the best up and coming draft guys out there. He does, he's a workout guy. He's a video guy. He's been breaking down video. He's been really into the international work as well. And Raphael, I, I just, I just, I, I'm a huge, huge fan. He's done several podcasts with us. So you can check those out if you want, including, I think an unconventional hot takes was the last one that we did with Raphael. And then Raphael and I afterwards will come back and we'll do uh, some post draft analysis and we'll actually do some draft grades as well. So you got all that to look forward to uh, in the coming days. Let's round out the lottery for a minute. At 11, it's Charlotte uh, hearing it's Kai Jones or it's Corey Kispert there. You couldn't get two more different players than Kai Jones and Corey Kispert. Corey Kispert sort of fits the Mitch Kupchak uh, pattern of kind of drafting the safe guy, the guy that you know, I think is, is, you know, being really good in college and what have you. Kai Jones doesn't really fit that. They actually need a big and Kai Jones is by far the most intriguing big out there because of his athleticism and what he can, how he can run up and down the court, but he's also a risk and he's also further behind than some of those other guys. I, here's the deal I think with, with Charlotte, they think they can probably get Kai Jones later. So you've got the Knicks, uh, several other teams, Oklahoma city trying to move up uh, to the 11th spot right now. I think that there's a chance that Charlotte just moves down, gets another asset, and then takes their guy a little bit later in the draft. And if they have 16 and 18, they have two swings at it, um, if you will. I'm not sure that Kispert will be there, but then you could, you know, absolutely get Kai Jones and then, you know, somebody else that you think could really help you um, in Charlotte. I'm not sure if that's going to be Oklahoma City or the Knicks or maybe another team that moves up, but a lot of, lot of smoke um, that Charlotte may trade this pick. Uh, but if they don't, uh, right now I'm going with Corey Kispert, who I think is the best shooter, uh, in the NBA and, and or in the NBA draft, uh, this year and, and certainly can fill a need for Charlotte because they do need perimeter shooting and, and Kispert's just, you know, great at it. I think the Indiana Pacers are going to be really pissed off, um, that he's not there on the board at 13. Cause I think they were looking at him as a replacement for Doug McDermott. Uh, but that's sort of what I'm hearing right now. Still could be Kai Jones at 11. I just think they feel a little more comfortable if they were drafting a little bit later. I'm in the draft. So let's see if they can get a deal. San Antonio, you know, if you know anything about San Antonio, this is a pretty tight ship. They don't leak a lot. Um, very difficult to get your arms around who they will and won't be drafting uh, on, a, on a given night. I think Usman Garuba has been the, the obvious choice because the Spurs like uh, like international players and they're, they're really after a big. And so you just kind of put two and two together and it's like, Oh, Garuba, uh, uh, sorry, not a Garuba, uh, Alpern and Singun, um, would be a great pick there. Garuba certainly in the mix there as is a surprise. Daron Sharp at North Carolina who has been shooting, um, really, really well in workouts and, and that guy that I think a lot of people are, are super excited about. Um, he's there as well. Jalen Johnson uh, is a guy certainly that could be the pick. I have them taking Trey Murphy out of Virginia right now instead of going with a five because they certainly have a Jakob Pertl there um, in the middle going with a guy that can play three or four. He's six, nine. He's got a long wingspan. He can stretch the floor. He can play defense. He needs to get stronger. I'm not sure he's got much of that off the dribble game, but if you're talking about him posting up or, or spotting up in the corner and shooting threes, I think Trey Murphy has that sort of Cam Johnson-esque feel to his game. Maybe Mikel Bridges that's just really, really hot right now. And so I have him going uh, to San Antonio at 12. At 13, I think the Pacers, number one, are really open to trading this pick. They're also going to be a team that probably will be talking to the Knicks, the Thunder, other teams that are trying to move up in the draft right now, especially if Corey Kispert is not on the board at 13. I think that may be the thing that sort of triggers a deal for them right now. They have a new head coach in Rick Carlisle. He would like uh, a, he would like a, a, a player that can come in and help right now. 
And, you know, Davian Mitchell could be there, uh, Corey Kispert. Um, I have them selecting Chris Duarte out of Oregon. Uh, if he's there, he's 24 years old. So he's, he's old, man. I mean, he's as old as like some like four year, five year veterans in the NBA, uh, but he can get a lot done. I actually think he's a really talented basketball player. He certainly can shoot it, can defend a very versatile player for them. And I think if they stay there and Kispert's not on the board, uh, Duarte is a guy who helps them right away. And I think that's just sort of the impetus right now. Moses Moody, certainly another name to watch in Indiana right now. He's still on my board and he may even be going higher than this, but Mo- Moody as a five years younger three and D guy who in many ways sort of models Duarte, not the world's greatest athlete. He's actually a lot longer than Duarte um, further along than Duarte was at the same time in his career. And so there's a pretty strong argument that Moody is probably the better pick uh, between him and Duarte, but certainly Duarte can be a favorite because he can help you right now. And then that gets us to 14 where Davian Mitchell sitting there and probably is the likely selection given how much the the coaching staff really likes uh, uh, Davian Mitchell. If he's sitting there at 14 and Duarte's off the board, which I think is maybe one guy that could threaten that there's other guys uh, that are out there for them, including Zaire Williams. Again, Moses Moody uh, is a guy if Josh Giddy. Um, were to follow them. He's certainly a prospect that they would be interested as well. Trey Murphy, another guy that they might might like. I like all of those guys, but man, Davian Mitchell, I think is a great fit um, in Golden State. And if they end up at seven with Franz Wagner, they've got, they've, they've added defense to this team. They've got Wagner who can defend multiple positions on the wing. You've got Mitchell, who's a lockdown, a one-on-one defender uh, to lock down uh, opposing point guards. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm pretty happy uh, with that. Maybe I, I again, I'm going to argue again that, you know, if Golden State really is going to swing for a young player, this might be and probably should be Kaminga. But I, I, I have him rate, ranked a little bit higher than Franz Wagner, who I have ninth on my big board there. Uh, but I, I can understand the appeal and, and how it becomes sort of a consensus pick between a guy that the coaches can live with as well as as well as the front office can live with. All right, that's picks one through 14 uh, in our mock. 15 through 60, you're going to have to head over to nbabigboard.com, subscribe. Uh, We really have so much good stuff going on over there. I'd really like you to consider subscribing and becoming a paid subscriber to uh, nbabigboard.com. I just did a live Zoom uh, with about 50 of our subscribers. Uh, We got in a bunch of questions talking about the draft. We have a really cool community going on over there uh, in the comment section. Lots of great stuff sort of happening. And uh, you're getting mock drafts, big board scouting reports, so much more. You'll get the draft grades uh, that we're doing on Friday. And then rolling right into next week where we're going to do our 2021 NBA draft pre- or 2022 NBA draft uh, preview uh, where Chet is going to be available. Uh, I know some people like they follow the draft for, you know, a couple, you know, a couple of weeks uh, towards uh, June or July. And then, you know, they sort of give up. Uh, I actually think that um, if you're not an all year draft fan, we can make you into one. And as you're watching the college basketball season and watching the G League or whatever, we're going to have tons of cool analysis um, real time. There's so many cool things that we're planning, uh, including rookie reports and, uh, you know, looking back at, dra- at at future and past draft classes, everything else. Look, the podcast will always be free. And that's one great way for you to get information um, from me and you're, and you're welcome to it. But I really think that you'll love our NBA big board.com newsletter. And so if you haven't went over there and checked it out, I think now's the time to go over and check it out. And we'll even offer you a deal uh, right now on, on the NBA big board, only $40 for a yearly sub, sub right now, which is the the lowest that we've had it with one small exception uh, where we did a little fire sale on a Wednesday night, uh, $40 gets you not only this year's draft, but next year's draft as well. The 2022 NBA draft, uh, because it's going to be in June. So if you subscribe now, it's going to go all the way until the end of July next year, um, which means you're going to get all the coverage that we have for the 2022 NBA draft. So then you're talking about $20 a draft. Um, you know, you're talking about like three, $3 and 80 cents a, uh, a, a week, uh, or sorry, a month. 
I, I think it's a really good deal. It's, it also sort of helps support me. I'm um, in the work that I'm doing. Uh, it's harder to do this work if it's only seasonal and if people are only going to subscribe uh, for you know two two months or or a few weeks out of the year. And so please consider heading over to mbabigboard.com, subscribing today. Grab that yearly subscription. Go ahead and, and partake of everything exciting that's going to happen, including that live draft coverage that we talked about, which is going to be happening on the website, as well as our Locked On NBA YouTube channel. I'm really excited to get into this draft and make sure that when you give us your email, you get those updates on this mock draft because this is Wednesday night at midnight Dallas time right now. I expect that we'll see some changes tomorrow with trades, uh, with with potential rumors coming out about this guy moving here or there or what have you. And so if you want to keep updated on our mock draft, make sure that you go over, give us your email address at nbabigboard.com. You've been listening to Chad Ford's nbabigboard.com. You've been listening to, let me catch that. You've been listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board podcast. Aloha.